Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of the Midweek Refill. I am Bishop A. Reginald Littman, your host and senior pastor of the New Mountaintop Church. We're always excited and delighted to share the truths of God's word with you. You know, for the past couple of months or so, we've been in a very interesting series called Trusting God with Your Entire Life. And I want to challenge you to go back and revisit those videos. You should be able to find the free PDF handout that accompanies that Bible study teaching with each of them that will help you to take a deeper dive into the Word of God. And they all come with discussion questions that will help you to really appropriate God's Word in your life. Tonight, I want to begin a series of teachings that's based on the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. And we're calling this Lessons from the 12 Disciples. I definitely want you to like, to share, to subscribe, and thank you so much for helping us to reach our goal of 1,000 subscribers. That is so exciting. But make sure that you hit the bell notification. That way you'll be notified every time new content is loaded. So make sure you share this with others. And also don't forget, right there, right there in the description box is a handout that accompanies this week's teaching as we go into part one of lessons from the 12 disciples. Well, we want to begin this week with Simon Peter, who is the rock of faith. Simon Peter, the rock of faith. And in this particular study, we're going to journey through the life of Simon Peter, who is one of the most prominent and relatable figures in the New Testament. You know, his experiences and challenges and transformation provide us with profound lessons of faith, leadership, and even redemption that continue to inspire and guide believers even until this day. So I really do hope that you get a lot out of this next 12 weeks of series as we talk about lessons from the 12 disciples. So let's jump into Peter's story. So Simon Peter, originally named Simon, was a fisherman from the town of Bethsaida. He was married and he even had a brother named Andrew, who also became a disciple of Jesus. Peter's life before encountering Jesus was marked by the toil of fishing and the challenges of everyday life. When we think about fishing, fishing today, and of course, I'm a fisherman, it's fun to me. I look forward to it. I don't have enough time to do it as much as I'd like to. But for fishermen whose lives and livelihood and families being fed would depend on a catch, this was indeed a very toiling profession. It was very hard work. And yet, Peter lived his life as a fisherman, and he faced all of the same common everyday challenges of individuals in his time frame. But not only that, Peter was also married, and he had a brother whose name was Andrew. In fact, you read in the New Testament about a story about the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. And Peter's life before encountering Jesus was marked by difficulties. Even while knowing Jesus, it was marked by difficulties. And so will our lives be. So Peter's life was one of many, many challenges. And I want to go through some of those challenges to help you and I to discover how God can use us in spite of our challenges. So let's talk about some of the key moments. Now, listen, Peter, like all of us, made lots and lots of mistakes and errors. However, I want to zero in on some of the key moments in Peter's life where we see those major transitions happen as we get to know Simon Peter, the rock of faith. So the first key moment in Peter's life was his confession of Christ. 
In Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 16, Peter makes a profound confession, acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So let's look at what happens there. In Matthew chapter 16, verse number 13 through 16, in the New International Version of the Bible, it reads like this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Jesus here is referring to himself. Verse 14, they replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. What do you say or who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And I love that passage of scripture because Peter speaks up with his typical boldness. He was very outspoken, very opinionated, very impetuous. But this time he confesses Christ for who he truly is. Matthew 16, verse 13 through 16 is a passage from the New Testament of the Bible in which Jesus has a conversation with his disciples about his identity. And in this passage, he expresses to them his concern with regard to who people were saying he was. And this passage is significant because it represents a really pivotal moment in the Gospel of Matthew, where Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, declares his belief in Jesus as the Messiah, the sent one, the son of the living God. Let's just break that down into some of the key elements. Look, the location here, this conversation takes place in the region of Caesarea Philippi, in a city in the northern part of Israel. But let's look at how he questioned the disciples, because Jesus initiates the conversation by asking the disciples about the popular opinions regarding his identity. And notice that Jesus uses the term son of man to refer to himself. This was a messianic title from the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14 was the reference to which Jesus was referring. Do remember that at the time of the text, they did not have the Gospels written. They were literally living the experiences that are recorded in the Gospels. But they did have the law and the prophets. So Jesus being a good Jew who was well indoctrinated in the law of Moses and the prophets would easily be able to reference Daniel chapter 7 being Old Testament scripture. We also see in this passage, the disciples' response. The disciples mentioned that people have various opinions about who Jesus is, and isn't that still true today? Some think that Jesus was John the Baptist, his cousin who had been beheaded. Some thought he was Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So they thought that quite possibly Jesus was a reincarnated being that had come back in the form of Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Some would argue that they thought that maybe Jesus had come back in the form or in the likeness, as others would think in terms of reincarnation as one of the prophets. And this was likely due to his vast knowledge of the scriptures of their day and the authority with which he spoke, the confidence that he moved about with, and the miracles that he worked. And these responses indicated that Jesus was widely recognized as a significant 
and even prophetic figure, but there was still great uncertainty about the identity of this man from Galilee. So we see Peter's confession in verse 16. Jesus turns the question directly to his disciples, asking them, I heard what you told me about what other folks in the community in the area, Caesarea Philippi, are saying about me, what their concept or perception of me is. But the golden question that Jesus asked them in verse 15 is, who do you say I am? And Peter responds with a very profound declaration of faith, stating, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And in this statement, Peter acknowledges Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah and as a divine person, the Son of God, emphasizing his divine sonship. And this confession by Peter marks literally a turning point in the Gospel of Matthew because it represents a clear recognition of Jesus' true identity as the Messiah and the Son of God. It literally reveals Peter's faith in Jesus as the promised Savior and as a significant moment of affirmation of Jesus' mission in the world, his role in the salvation of mankind. And so Jesus would go on to build his church literally on the rock of Peter's confession. And that's where we get Matthew 16 and 18. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Was he talking about a physical rock? No, he was talking about upon the sound knowledge, awareness, and confession of who I am, my mission in this world, that is the foundation of the church that Jesus would build. So this is quite profound. And this passage is often cited today as a foundational text in Christian theology. Peter exercised an amazing discipline here. And we see his first key moment is Peter's confession in Christ. But that was not his only key moment that we find revealed in scripture. The second key moment in Peter's life was the transfiguration. Now, Peter was one of three disciples that was chosen to witness Jesus's transfiguration on the mountain. And you can find that in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 1 through 9. And again, if you're just tuning in with us, I want to remind you that there is a PDF right there in the description box below where you can get full notes to this entire teaching along with some great personal discovery questions that will help you to apply this teaching to your life as we explore the life of the 12 apostles. So let's look now at the transfiguration and how this was a key moment in Simon Peter's life. In Matthew 17, we read these words, verse number one. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. Verse 2, there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, so it was glistening, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, you know that impetuous Peter, 
a bright cloud covered them. And the voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now, this is such a moving scripture because we see so many things that happen in this passage. In fact, let's look at the sixth verse through the ninth verse of Matthew 17, and I'll read it from the New International Version. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. So they're seeing Moses and Elijah having a conversation with Jesus. Jesus's face has just begun to radiate. I mean, it's a beautiful sight. They see Jesus almost go into an angelic stage. And then they hear cracking the sky, the voice of God, the father giving validation to his son. So they are so moved that they fall face down to the ground and they are terrified. Verse seven, but Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man, referred to himself, has been raised from the dead. Now, I know that was a lot, so let's try to break it down just a little bit. Because there's several things that happen in Matthew 17, 1 through 9, that will help us to really see how the transfiguration affected Peter. So let's go through it. On the screen, if you're taking notes, I've listed a number of things. And again, in the handouts, you'll find all of this in there where you won't have to try and figure it all out at one time. So Matthew 17, verse 1 through 9, literally, it recapitulates the story of the transfiguration of Jesus, where he is transformed in his appearance on a mountain and Moses and Elijah appear representing the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So in Moses, you've got the law. In Elijah, you've got the prophets. And with Jesus, you've got the gospel and the new covenant all in one place. So Peter is so excited that he starts running off at the mouth and says, hey, Lord, this is a great place for us to be. Look, I'm going to form the first church construction committee. I'm going to start the building fund off with $100. And he suggests building shelters for them. And a divine voice then affirms Jesus as God's son. So let me give you some key practical principles concerning Peter's change as he witnesses the transfiguration of Jesus. One, we see the recognition of Jesus' divinity. Peter, James, and John, they witnessed Jesus' divine glory in the transfiguration. And this really does underscore the importance of recognizing Jesus, not just as a teacher or just as a prophet, but as the divine son of God. You see, with Elijah and Moses being there, we see Elijah as a prophet. We see Moses really as a teacher, even a shepherd, even as a pastor. Jesus transcends all roles. And Jesus is shown as the divine son of God, declared and honored and so spoken of by God himself from heaven. This is my son. Hear him. So it teaches us the significance of acknowledging Jesus's true nature and the authority he has in and over our lives. But the second movement we see in Matthew 17, as we just kind of break that chapter down, is reverence and humility. Because Peter's initial reaction was one of reverence. He wanted to honor Jesus. He wanted to even honor Moses. He wanted to honor Elijah and forever encapsulate the moment by building shelters. I guess that he... And James and John were just going to sleep outside or something. I don't know. 
Maybe they were going to bunk with Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. I'm not sure what his plan was. But when he was confronted with the presence of God, he fell on his face in humility. And we learn the importance there of approaching God with reverence and humility in our worship and in our encounters with him. Peter put his plan to the side when the presence of God came about. How much better would our lives be if we were to put all of our ideas and great great scams and schemes and thoughts to the side when the presence of God comes about? But thirdly, we see them listening to Jesus because the divine voice from God instructs disciples to listen to him, hear him, hear Jesus. And this principle emphasizes the importance of actively listening to Jesus and obeying his teachings and following his guidance in our everyday lives. It reminds us that Jesus is the ultimate authority in all manners of life. But then the fourth movement we see in Matthew 17 is overcoming fear. So the disciples were initially terrified. Remember the scripture says that they they just kind of fell on their faces, just so afraid of what they saw, what they felt, what they experienced by this supernatural event on this mountain. But Jesus comforts them and tells them, hey, don't be afraid. This teaches us something. It teaches us something. It teaches us that even in awe-inspiring or challenging situations, we can find comfort and strength through our faith in Jesus. What lessons that is. But fifthly, Matthew 17 and this transfiguration moment teaches us about timing and discernment. Because Jesus instructs the disciples not to share what they had witnessed until after his resurrection. So this highlights the principle of discernment and timing and sharing spiritual experiences or revelations at the right time with the right people. And notice that this is not recorded in Peter's book. It's in Matthew. So they told it, but they waited to tell it. So not everything needs to be shared immediately. And wisdom is needed in how and when, and even with whom we should communicate particularly spiritual truths. So Peter's change after witnessing the transfiguration emphasizes the need for recognizing Jesus's divinity and approaching God with reverence and humility and actively listening to Jesus and overcoming fear through faith and exercising discernment and sharing spiritual experiences. And all of these principles that you'll see that you see on the screen can guide us literally into deepening our faith. Wow. Let's look at the third key moment in Simon Peter's life. So the third key moment in Simon Peter's life was his denial and his restoration. So the first key moment again was Peter's life was changed by his confession of Christ. And then secondly, He witnessed the transfiguration of Christ, but the third key moment, which was equally as powerful, though not as prideful, was Peter's denial and ultimate restoration by the Lord Jesus. So let's look at the text and see what happened in his life concerning this. Matthew 26, verse 69 through 75 in the New International Version reads like this. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. And this is while Jesus is being crucified. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Verse 71, then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. You see, Peter is hiding because they are all afraid of being killed like Jesus was. And verse 72 says he denied it again with an oath. 
I don't know the man. I swear I don't know the man. Verse 73. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Verse 74. Then he began to call down curses and swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. And verse 75 says, Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. So friends, the lessons that Peter might have learned here and that we as believers can glean from this passage are numerous. And I put them on the screen for you if you're taking notes. And again, don't forget to get the handout. The first one is the fallibility of human faith. Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, denied knowing him in a moment of fear and pressure. How do you handle letting others know that you know him at your job, in your family, in the marketplace, when you're under fear and under pressure? And this demonstrates that even the most dedicated, dedicated believers can falter in their faith. It reminds us of the need for humility and reliance on God's strength, acknowledging our own human weaknesses. But we also also see consequences of fear and peer pressure. Because Peter's denials were driven by fear of association with Jesus and peer pressure. And this teaches us about the powerful influence of fear and societal expectations on our choices. See, believers can learn really to stand firm in their truth, even when we're facing opposition or ridicule, by relying on the strength that comes from God. But thirdly, we see Jesus' foreknowledge. That simply means that he foretold Peter back in Matthew 26, 34, which came true exactly as he had predicted. Before the rooster crows three times, you will deny me. You will say you don't know me. Even though he was doing all that big talk about, I'll die with you. Yet he denied him. And this highlights Jesus' knowledge of our human behavior and events. It teaches believers that Jesus knows our weaknesses and our failures, but still loves us, still forgives us offering us opportunities for redemption, for to be set free, to be made right with God. And fourthly, we see remorse and repentance. Because after his denial, Peter experienced deep remorse and he wept bitterly. And this shows the importance of genuine repentance when we recognize our mistakes and our sins. Believers can learn that it's not the denial or failure that defines us, but it is our response to it. And Peter's remorse paved the way for his restoration and his continued service to the Lord Jesus Christ. Restoration and forgiveness is also seen in that because later on in the Gospels, we see Jesus restoring Peter and commissioning him to the flock And this emphasizes Jesus' willingness to forgive and to restore those who genuinely repent. And I just love that. Because it doesn't matter how much you mess up. It matters how much you fess up and then get up and clean up and step up to to your purpose for which God has called you. So let me give you some lessons, if you will that can be learned from Peter. All right? So, here's number one. We must have faith in Christ. So here's an action step for you to take this week. Confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, just as Peter did. Maybe you're saying, I'm already a believer, I'm already a part of a church or whatever, but have you confessed him as your Lord and Savior to your coworkers or in front of those people that you interact with? Have you interjected Jesus 
in a confession that he's your Lord and Savior in a conversation standing in the supermarket. Faith in Christ is something we learn from Peter's, from Peter's lifestyle, life experience with Jesus. I want to challenge you this week to confess him. And if you're not saved, you can confess him now and he'll come into your heart. It's just that simple, just that easy. Here's number two. We learn leadership from Peter. And the action step is to embrace your role as a leader in your faith community, knowing that Christ can use ordinary people for extraordinary purposes. Peter was not willing to display his leadership in the Christian community. He abandoned the followers of Christ when chaos was going on. When things go south, are you willing to remain faithful to your role in the kingdom of God? And here's number three. We learn from Peter's life, redemption and forgiveness. And here's the action step. Trust in Christ's forgiveness and allow him to restore you no matter your past mistakes. Hey, we've all made mistakes. I've made some major ones that I'm not proud of. But guess what? It's none of your business. <laughs> I know you didn't see that one coming, and I'm not being sarcastic. You know why it's none of your business? It's not even my business anymore. You know why? I gave it to the Lord, left it in his hands, and he threw it away into a sea of forgetfulness, and he remembers it no more. You can do that same thing, my friend, you can trust in Christ's forgiveness and you can allow him to restore you no matter how many mistakes you've made in your past. And then you can tell other people that try to go scuba diving in the sea of forgetfulness, they'll never hit the bottom. They'll never find it. Don't even waste your time. It's not your business what I have done in my past. I love it. Here's number four. We also learn perseverance from the life of Peter. And if you're getting something out of this, please like, share, leave a comment. Let me know. Let me know. Perseverance is a lesson we learned from the life of Peter. And here's an action step for you. Make sure you get the handout. That's another action step, but here's the action step for perseverance. Learn from Peter's moments of failure and continue to follow Jesus even when you're faced with challenges. You know, when Jesus rose, he left word with the angel to tell the two Marys that Jesus said, tell my disciples and Peter to meet me in Galilee. Peter had excommunicated himself, left before the benediction, denied Jesus, so that cussing and everything and trying to act like he didn't even know Jesus. But he got an invitation to a private meeting with a resurrected Lord. Not because Peter was good, not even that he had repented, but because grace is available for you even while you're still in your mistakes. So persevere and learn from Peter's moments of failure and continue to follow Jesus even when you are faced with challenges. And here's the final takeaway from Peter's life. Have boldness in your witnessing. So the action step is this, be courageous in sharing your faith and recognizing Jesus as the Messiah. Don't just worship him at church, but worship him at the mall with your lifestyle. When others inquire of your hope or whatever it is that has you smiling, that's an opportunity to be a bold witness for Jesus. Wow, man. I hope you guys got something out of this teaching about the life of Peter, uh, that rock that he was able to produce that belief and that faith in Jesus Christ for who he is. I want to say thank you so much for watching. Um, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for liking. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for subscribing. Don't forget to get the free handout that is right there in the description box below. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, and hit that bell notification so next time we come on, you'll be among the first to know. This is Bishop Lippman. Get the handout, and I'll see you Sunday morning right here, same channel, 9.30 a.m. Until next time, 
you go with God.